Greetings from Alberta. It's a great joy for us to be with you there in Toronto this morning. And thank you for the invitation to be part of your prayer sessions today. It was recommended that Dr. Thomas Lambie be the topic for our rec reflection this morning. You may be wondering what prompted me to research and study the missionary entrepreneur, Dr. Thomas Lambie. I was asked to present a paper on the life and ministry of Dr. Lambie at a special international conference on SIM history held in Addis Ababa in July 2013. Soon after that historic conference, Gary Corwin and Tim Giesbeek of SIM International encouraged me with the idea of writing a full-blown biography of Dr. Lambie. Well, that idea stayed with me, and now, seven years later, and thanks to God, the biography has been completed and published by Wiffenstock. Lila and I never had the privilege of meeting Dr. and Mrs. Lambie, but we certainly have gotten to know them well over the past few years. One of the miracles and great joys of the whole writing project was to meet Dr. and Mrs. Lambie's granddaughter. Paul Bowers, himself an SIMer and descendant of Lambie, had given us the information that a granddaughter of the Lambies was still alive in Wales and that she might be a useful resource. Well, on our way back from Ethiopia, after one of our retirement short-term trips, we made it a point to travel through Wales and meet this Lambie granddaughter. She was Margaret Hall, well into her 70s. What a dear lady, full of history and possessing a great assortment of Lambie's original family letters and objects relating to the family, like a ring from Emperor Haile Selassie, <laughs> a royal cloak that had belonged to the emperor, and other treasures. We became great friends with Margaret and invited her over here to our home in Grand Prairie, Alberta, the following summer. She came with her daughter, and we did a tour of the Rockies together and became lifelong friends. It was surely God's grace and goodness that we got to know her. As you can imagine, she made writing the Lambie book come alive. Now, some personal background about Dr. Lambie. He was born in 1885, one of nine children in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and was raised under the tutelage of godly parents. Dr. James Wallace, pastor of the Eighth Presbyterian Church of Pittsburgh, gave young Lambie, and I quote, much needed help in learning to believe in Jesus Christ and to walk in Christian paths. At the age of 16, Lambie took medical training at Western Pennsylvania Medical College and graduated at the age of 21. He attended various missionary conventions where John R. Mott Harold the Credo, the evangelization of the world in this generation. In 1907, at the age of only 22, Lambie was accepted by the Foreign Missions Board of the United Presbyterian Church to serve in Sudan. Lambie was initially stationed in Sudan with two other single men at Dolob Hill, which was located on a small tributary flowing out of the Ethiopian highlands. Other Presbyterian missionaries dubbed the three bachelors the three monks of Dolob Hill. This was the house they lived in. On one of Lambie's vacations in Alexandria, Egypt, he spotted Charlotte Claney, a young Presbyterian missionary school teacher, recently arrived from the USA. He described her as bright and vivacious. Somehow I found her attractive. In 1909, Thomas and Charlotte were married in Alexandria, Egypt. Two children were born to them, Wallace in 1910 and Betty in 1911. Margaret Hall in Wales, whom we mentioned before is a daughter of Betty. In 1912, Lambie, now with a wife and two children, came back to pioneer the work at Nasser, further up the Sobot River. Along with other Presbyterian missionaries, he continued the outreach to the New Air. During those five years, Lambie was much involved in doing medical work and building a home for his family. He found little time to evangelize and was beginning to question whether he was accomplishing much as a missionary. He wrote, I quote, Often I failed, 
but stumbling along and falling, staggered by adverse circumstances, and weakened by malaria and dysentery, and hard climate, we struggled on." End of quote. In late 1917, they went on another furlough. And wouldn't you know, Lambie's brother-in-law, Dr. Edward Wiggins, offered Lambie a tempting position as his assistant in the Wiggins Medical Practice in Philadelphia. Lambie struggled with the invitation to stay in, in Philadelphia and get rich, but his commitment to missions in Africa won the day, and in 1918, the Lambies returned to Nasser. From that station in Hot Sudan, on a clear day, the beautiful mountain escarpments of Ethiopia were very visible. Often gazing east, Lambie dreamed and prayed about the possible opportunities for the gospel in that great country of Ethiopia. Just over 100 years ago, the terrible Spanish flu epidemic was raging across the world. It was rampant in Ethiopia. Famous Ethiopian historian Richard Pankhurst has estimated that nearly one half of the Ethiopian population died around 1919 because of this epidemic. A governor in western Ethiopia posted some 30 miles north of Gambela begged the British officials in Sudan to assign some medical missionary personnel to Ethiopia. Therefore, Lambie and two Presbyterian missionary colleagues, with the approval of the American Presbyterian Board, successfully made the 30-mile exploratory trip by mule into the Ethiopian highlands. There they were welcomed by the Ethiopian governor, Beru. By that time, the influenza had mostly abated, and by November 1919, the first Presbyterian medical mission station was established in western Ethiopia, and the good news of Jesus Christ was shared. In 1922, the Lambie family was again due a furlough, and so the four of them made their way from western Ethiopia by mule to Addis Ababa, in preparation to take the train to Djibouti from where they would sail to America. In God's providence, during their time in Addis Ababa, Dr. Lambie was introduced to Rastafari Makonan, who later, as Emperor of Ethiopia, took the name Haile Selassie. Negotiations were made that the American Presbyterian Mission should build a hospital in Addis Ababa. A fully furnished hospital was completed and functioning by 1924. By the way, that well-built stone building in Addis Ababa continues to stand, now being used for other medical purposes. Paul Duff Carrar and I visited that site this past March. And we had coffee at the Lambie Cafe, <clears throat> which still functions across the street from that famous hospital. When Lambie had first entered Ethiopia in 1919, it was with the vision of reaching the lost in southern and western Ethiopia. These people groups were dominated by primal religionists and Muslims. Lambie became discouraged about his mission board because they made no advance to the unreached of southern Ethiopia. Another factor that disheartened Lambie was an irreparable breach between him and another Presbyterian surgeon who was serving in the hospital. In 1927, the Lambies resigned from the Presbyterian mission, and in so doing, they forfeited the future possibility of benefits like scholarships for their two teenage children, medical assistance for the family, and a generous pension in their retirement. So what could ha happen to them now? No mission board. So, in 1927, the Lambies, joined by two other couples, the Alfred Buxtons and George Rhodes, with the goal to reach the unevangelized tribes of southern Ethiopia under the Abyssinian Frontiers Mission, joined forces. This new organization, though, was short-lived. At the same time, Roland Bingham had just returned from Australia and New Zealand, where he had established SIM boards and recruited a number of candidates to serve with <laughs> SIM in Nigeria. However, Bingham soon discovered that transportation costs from the Far East via England to Nigeria were absolutely prohibitive. So in 1927, the new group, Abyssinian Frontiers Mission, or AFM, 
was invited by Roland Bingham to join the SIM. Bingham wrote in the SIM publication, Evangelical Christian, and I quote, the gain was immediate. All the machinery of the SIM at the home end was immediately available. A constituency of praying and giving people already prepared, unquote. When the initial SI missionary party arrived in Addis Ababa on Christmas Day, 1927, they were forbidden to leave Addis Ababa for the interior by some very conservative elements, both within the Orthodox Church and the government. Eventually, by prayer and persuasion, this reluctance was overcome. And amazingly, by 1936, there were 16 mission stations providing education and medical assistance in various Ethiopia locations. Two indigenous churches were functioning among two different people groups. Portions of scripture were made available in the local languages of three tribes, Sadama, Kambata, and Waleta. These newly established SIM stations were located on properties contracted from local landowners. So, the missionaries lived under a constant tension because non-Ethiopians were not legally allowed to purchase property. Because of this stress and uncertainty about any further SIM expansion, Dr. Bingham advised Lambie to renounce his American citizenship and become an Ethiopian citizen. Lambie did this in 1935 in the presence of the Emperor Haile Selassie. In 1935, because Lambie was now an Ethiopian citizen, he was appointed executive director of the Ethiopian Red Cross and served in this stressful position for a year during the Italian-Ethiopian War. In that position, he coordinated 16 different Red Cross units. Eventually, in May 1936, the Italians invaded Addis Ababa. Now Lambie found himself in an even more difficult situation. In 1936, Lambie was called before the Italian general, Graziani, to report on the Ethiopian Red Cross activities, as well as the location of the 16 SIM stations. At that time, Lambie actually made concession to the Italians, hoping they might allow SIM to continue missionary activity in Ethiopia. He based his action on Romans 13.1, be subject to the higher powers, but the Italians forged additional erroneous material to the Lambie letter and gave it wide publicity. Because of this forged letter, Heidi Selassie, now in exile in England, alienated Lambie from his good graces. The whole situation became rather ugly because of the forged letter, and Lambie wrote to Bingham, I should not have written as I did. It's a complicated story, to be sure. After 20 year hiatus from Sudan, and being eventually barred from returning to Ethiopia, the Lambies found themselves back in the Sudan in 1939. As director of the SIM Sudan field, Lambie was challenged to develop a working relationship with a new breed of British officials who were limiting SIM's evangelism activities. These British officials were young and well-educated and looked upon missions as merely providers of medical and educational services, with no focus on evangelism. One of the British officials in Sudan described Lambie, quote, a likable, mischievous old man, unable to produce the results we want. I trust that Lambie will build his efforts inward and not outward. Another burden that Dr. Lambie faced was that the SIM colleagues in Sudan were complaining to SIM International Director Dr. Roland Bingham that Lambie was incompetent as the SIM Sudan leader. Malcolm Forsberg expressed the mood of the SIM Sudan missionaries when he wrote to Dr. Bingham, quote, Opposition to Dr. Lambie's leadership is not new. We are unanimous in feeling we can no longer continue working under Dr. Lambie's leadership. In July, 1942, exhausted and in need of medical attention, the Lambies left Sudan and went for a furlough. Now, some comments about Charlotte Lambie, 
faithful wife of Thomas for nearly 40 years. She had an eye for beauty in the way she decorated her various homes, both in Sudan and Ethiopia. She loved gardening and planted appropriate vegetables and fruit trees in each location. She had a beautiful singing voice and would accompany herself on a small pump organ. Husband Tom often described her skills in packing the needed food for the hundreds of miles of mule trekking they did together. Lambie wrote about their treks. There were so many factors to be considered before we left on a trek by mule. The length of the journey, how many extra people to feed, what supplies could be purchased locally on the way. We never started off without our bowl of porridge, coffee, toast and jam, and sometimes bacon and eggs. It's almost unbelievable that Charlotte was with him on nearly all of his treks and journeys by mule. An amazing woman. In 1945, three years after Lambies had left Sudan and gone on furlough, Lambie felt that his time in the United States should end. Ever the, entre ever the entrepreneur in mission, Lambie heard that the Independent Board of Presbyterian Foreign Missions was investigating expanding their medical ministry in Palestine. Thomas and Charlotte joined the Presbyterian Mission in December 1945 and set sail for the Holy Land. This journey was met with tragedy. Charlotte's health was frail and questionable. Tragically, she died of a cerebral hemorrhage in Jan on January 25, 1946 in Port Said, Egypt. She was buried in a small Anglican cemetery. With deep grief, Lambie continued his journey to Palestine. Always moving on, he eventually launched a 75-bed TB sanatorium just south of Bethlehem. Would Lambie ever marry again? In 1947, never to give up, he married a former SIM missionary from West Africa, Miss Irma Schneck. Together they served faithfully in the Bethlehem TB sanitarium, sanatorium for seven years. Then suddenly, on Easter morning, 1954, Lambie died while meditating at the garden tomb. He was buried in the Presbyterian Church Cemetery in Bethlehem. It seems there were so many trials and heartbreaking family experiences for the Lambies. The marriage of their daughter Betty to a young Oxford student in 1930 ended in a sad divorce after 10 years. This left Betty with four children to fend for herself outside of London on a small poultry and animal farm where it was a continual struggle to survive. Then, in 1935, five years later, their son Wallace was serving as a clerk in a branch of the National City Bank of New York in Columbia, Latin America. He was suddenly killed when a movie, movie theater roof collapsed. The Lambies received a telegram while trekking in the north that their son had died, but they never knew the circumstances of their son's death until they returned to Addis a month later. And we have already made mention of the unexpected death of Charlotte <laughs> while at sea. Such sad events in their lives. In conclusion, here are several significant contributions to the cause of missions made by Dr. Lambie. His obedience to the call of God to share Christ first in Sudan, then in Ethiopia, and finally in Jordan. Number two, his strong faith in divine providence for needed personnel and finance in the cause of missions. Number three, his willingness to sacrifice as he traveled hundreds of miles by mule and horse to get the gospel out to the unreached in southern Ethiopia. Four, his ability to write books, all seven of them, not as a missiologist, but more as a readable reporter. And five, he is hailed as the founder of the Ethiopian Word of Life Church, which now boasts some 11 million members and who is now sending her own missionaries to unreached people groups around the world. Clarence Duff, an SI missionary colleague of Lambie in Ethiopia, had this to say about Dr. Lambie, quote, 
I regard Dr. Lambie as one of the best and greatest men it was my privilege to know. If sometimes his judgment or his actions proved to be unwise, he rose above his faults, outlived them and the criticism incurred, and went on to fresh achievements. End of quote. And now, may each of us be encouraged to follow in the footsteps of our SIM pioneers.